Um, so I, I'd like to kind of go right back to before even you were involved in, in Kerry's campaign or Obama's campaign sure. to your valedictory address uh, <laughs> from Holy Cross. Um, and in it, obviously, in, in your speech, you've mentioned the cynicism that it, it can sometimes be hard to avoid. Um, in it, you predicted that the pressures of the working world between money and time, you wouldn't be able to kind of live up to that ideal that the, the college gave you of, of con contributing to your community and, and really kind of focusing on, on the ideals and, and staying true to that. Did you, have you found that you, that prediction was right? Uh, I mean, you know, I, I think that <laughs> because I gave up eight years <laughs> to, go, <laughs> to go work on political campaigns for uh, very, very little money and no time <laughs> whatsoever. <laughs> um, I did, and I, and I think that, look, I think that this is hard because, you know, so many people want to make an impact, so many people graduating college want to make an impact and there are those pressures and you know as I said in that speech and have said since then I think that you can contribute and you can make a difference you don't have to run for office you don't have to participate in politics you don't have to be in public life but you have to do more you have to do more than vote <laughs> you have to you have to be knowledgeable about the issues you have to and, and like like I was just saying I mean I really think you know we are fed such a steady stream of bad news and and because of that, it's very easy to just say, why even bother? And why even try? But there's so many good examples of people around the world doing good things. And, and, and they're not necessarily in public life. Some people are in NGOs, some people are in nonprofits, some people are just helping out in their community. Um, and I think if we had, you know, if, if you continue to keep that spirit alive as you go through life in very little ways, um, I think you could probably have an, have an impact. And have you started your commencement speech for Holy Cross? I have not. <laughs> I have not. I've been thinking a lot about it. I have to. I guess I have to use new material um, <laughs> this time around. But uh, but I'm excited to go back because you know I was I was fortunate. You know Holy Cross is a Jesuit institution, and I think part of uh, Holy Cross is a college in in central Massachusetts. If for those who don't know, very small. And um, I, you know I think having a Jesuit education, which our education was very linked to the community around us. Um, so what we were learning in the classroom was intimately connected to the work I was doing in a welfare office or you know, cancer patients that I was visiting or community organizing that I was doing. I think that kind of thing instills in you kind of a spirit of, of service that, that can last a lifetime. And so then moving on to, you were speaking about how inspirational it was to work with Barack Obama so closely. Uh, and what you read a lot about your process, uh, which is, I think, something a lot of students can relate to, is that uh, like early morning, late night, mm -hmm. um, kind of coffee, Red Bull fueled, um, like drafts and, no and more drafts. Obviously, most of us don't ep end up writing a presidential speech at the mm -hmm. end of it. Um, but w how was that? Uh, what is your creative process like in terms yeah, of? It's brutal. I, I mean, in many ways, aside from the fact that it was you know writing for the president, it was like I never left college. The same <laughs> habits applied. I was still you know procrastinating to the last possible minute. <laughs> Um, the president procrastinates the last possible minute. I remember in the, the 2008 convention speech, um, the, so I sat with um, a woman who went on to become Michelle Obama's speechwriter. She's a very good friend of mine, Sarah Hurwitz. And she had written for Hillary Clinton before that. And so Sarah is very organized, you know, does not procrastinate, gets everything done. Michelle Obama is like that too. And so Michelle and Sarah were done with their 2008 convention speech with Michelle's about a month before the convention. <laughs> and uh, Obama and I and a couple others were practicing it for the first time the day of the convention. <laughs> and his wife just looks at him and she just kind of shakes his head, you know, shakes her head. Um, so the process was very, I mean, when we had time, when there wasn't a crisis, um, you know, a, a normal day would be the speechwriters all get together, talk about the speeches that are coming up that week. We'd work on the speech in the middle of the day, send it around to everyone else in the White House and the administration. They'd all send their edits in by like four or five o'clock. It would go in the president's book by six or seven p.m. He would, he always went home for dinner every night, still does, goes home for dinner, hangs out with the girls, puts them to bed like 8, 30, 9 o'clock, Michelle goes to bed and then he stays up till like one in the morning, reading all his briefing materials and then maybe he'll make a few edits. That's like the normal process. Big speeches, it's like all this goes out the window. Um, my favorite story about this is the closest we got to not having a speech was when he went to Oslo to accept the Nobel Peace Prize. <laughs> so 
Which was ironic because he asked Ben Rhodes and I, who worked on that speech together, to start researching maybe three months before the speech, which was the furthest time out he had ever started thinking about a speech. It was very important to him. And he immediately said, look, this speech has to be, how could I, a commander in chief in the middle of two wars, accept a Nobel Prize for peace and why that's not contradictory. And you know, let's do a whole speech on war and peace. And I wanna, I wanna talk about philosophers and I wanna go back to just war theory. And like, he, he like directed the actual research that we were gonna do for the speech. But then a couple months pass and you know, the week before he's gotta do this big speech on Afghanistan so he doesn't have any time. So the day that we're leaving for Oslo, he gives us, he, he, he calls us into the Oval Office that morning. And he said, all right, I just took the draft last night and um, I started writing myself. And he comes out with like 12 pages, <laughs> yellow notepad pages full of writing. And he's like, I like some of your draft. Here's my 12 pages, there's no ending. We get on the plane at six o'clock tonight, let's get this done. <laughs> and Ben and I are just like, oh my God. So we all, <laughs> we all get on the plane to Oslo and of course, everyone goes to bed, like, like Gibbs, Rahm Emanuel, everyone's like, oh, you're on your own. Good luck, everyone. <laughs> and so um, the president and Ben and myself and Samantha Power are the only ones who are helping out on the speech. <laughs> and it was, uh, as you were mentioned earlier, I'm a little afraid to fly. It was one of the worst <laughs> flights ever. So at like four in the morning, now he lands in Oslo and, del and delivers the speech right away. So about four in the morning, um, I'm in the corner of the, of the plane trying to work on the ending and the thing's rocking back and forth. And I like, this is like me getting over my fear of flying because there's nothing else I can do but finish the speech. Ben's working with the president on edits. Finally, the president just looks at us and he's like, so I'm delivering this in, in three hours. Should I sleep now? Should I take a nap? Or should I keep working with you guys? We're like, okay, here's the plan. You're the president, you take a nap. We'll keep working. We'll circle back when we land. And it, it was so last minute that on the elevator ride down to where the stage was, he stopped at the floor we were on, handed me the last page of edits. We put them in the prompter as he was walking up there and then he delivered the speech. And uh, after the speech, he calls me and he's like, so I think that went well. And, I was like, <laughs> <laughs> and he's like, hey, just really great job. Thanks for everything. He's like, just one thing. I'm like, he goes, can we never ever do that again? <laughs> and I was like, that's what you said last yeah. time. <laughs> so that's, that's the process. But. So then, in early March of last year, it was widely reported that you were making a break for Hollywood and that you were going to try your hand as a screenwriter. Is yeah. that something that you're, you're doing currently? It's or a long, slow journey out to yeah. Hollywood <laughs> a year later. No, um, so my friend and I, um, who we, we've both been working for Obama since uh, 2005, 2004 and five, he, he was the press secretary in Iowa for that very exciting campaign. Uh, and I was in Chicago, you know, we took notes we kept journals, not just of like everything Obama did that day. It wasn't really about him, it was about all of us, the experience of a bunch of young people on a campaign. And so we have wanted to do a television show about this for quite some time. So the two of us left the White House at the same time and we decided that, you know, as we're writing this thing, we needed some kind of an income on the side. So we started this business. Um, of course, there's always like another client that comes along that's like preventing us from actually working on the screenplay, but we hope this spring and summer to really start digging into it because, you know, my view is I think um, <coughs> there's been some wonderful political programming <coughs> over the last 10 years, 20 years. Today, it's really bent towards, I mean, you've got like House of <laughs> Cards is the ultimate cynical view of politics. Veep is an unbelievably hilarious show but treats politics as a joke. And I think there is a space for a show, for a story about politics as Yes, there's cynicism. Yes, there's disappointments. Yes, it takes a long time to get some really hard things done. And, and, and people can be really down about things. But there is a reason that at a time when public faith and public, faith in public institutions is at an all-time low, where, at least in the United States, more young people turned out to vote than at any time in history. There is mm. something to that. And uh, exploring that, I think, would make for a good story. And you've also been quite vocal then in terms of real politicians engaging in different ways uh, with uh, Obama's Between the Ferns, uh, between, two ferns. between Two Ferns video. Uh, and, uh, and you approve of that? Anyway, you think uh, that? Very much so. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I think, look, this, like, reporters in the media will do their whole thing on Between Two Ferns because 
everything that the White House does has to be, you know, is this the end for Obama? Has he bet the farm here? Someone actually, <laughs> someone actually said that the Between Two Friends video was Obama betting the farm just because he did this video, which is just really funny. Um, but what they don't understand is, I mean, that's a very kind of old fashioned debate. You know, most, the fact that the, the night after um, Between, Between Two Ferns aired, uh, before Funny or Die put it out, like 16,000 people went to healthcare.gov and, and, and if, if that made one person sign up for health insurance, mm. it was worth the president's time. One person who might have not thought about, I, I want to go get health insurance. So, and it was hilarious. And <laughs> I, I will say, I was not in the White House, obviously, for a while he was filming it, but mm. my friends all were and they were telling me about it. They did, you know, multiple takes on, on some of those uh -huh. and he ad-libbed. President ad lived a lot of that, and he got he got funnier as he went on. <laughs> I mean, he was just killing it. So um, I think that Zach and the and the funnier die people were sort of impressed. Brilliant. Yeah, I'm sure um, people are dying to ask some questions. So would anyone like to ask John a question themselves? Yeah. Yeah. To the point where you have the Democrats saying, uh, don't repeat it, fix it, almost what the Republicans could be saying. <laughs> right. Well, but there's so many great benefits to it. Great benefits. So, a few things that are like, you know, um, unique to this political environment. So, the Senate, the, the Senate candidates in 2014 happen to all be from deeply red states in the United States and states that have largely gone Republican <laughs> and largely vote Republican and really didn't vote for Obama, but still have Democrats in the Senate left over from way back when. So these Democrats are particularly skittish <laughs> about supporting, uh, supporting the president and embracing the health care law. I will say that there is a reason it took more than a century <laughs> to pass universal health care in our country and that every president since Truman tried to do it, and many tried very hard and got very close, like the Clintons and everyone, and, and, and came up a little short. And that's because healthcare is an extremely complicated topic, and um, it also is very easy to uh, instill fear in people uh, with healthcare attacks. It's very easy to tell people you're gonna lose your doctor, you're gonna lose your insurance, you're gonna lose this. I mean, this whole notion of you know individual freedom is obviously very powerful in America, and uh, harping on that is one way that um, opponents of any kind of change can succeed. So, also when the president passed the law, and many times since then, he said himself his message was, "Look, this law is not perfect, and we will need fixes to this law as we go." Social Security passed in 1933. There were so many changes to Social Security over the years before it became the program. In, in America that we know today. Medicare, Medicaid, all of those programs were added to fixed over the course of, of decades. So the president's very aware and willing to, and he's, he's shown that he's willing to change the healthcare program, delay dates if it doesn't work, you know, um, extend enrollment periods as he has up until now. So he, he's, very, he's willing to be nimble to make this law work. That's what he cares about the most. Um, so the fix-it thing doesn't bother the White House at all. Um, but they will continue to sell the benefits. I mean, you've got 4 million people signed up now just to the exchanges, probably another 10 million um, between people who are on Medicaid now, which is a program for the, um, the poor, and young people who can now stay on their parents' health insurance till they're 26. You're gonna have close to 15 something million people in America who didn't have health care before will now have it. And whether that plays to the president's political benefit in 2014 or not, you know, is, is up for grabs. But long term, I think history will view this as um, not a win for the president, but a win for the country. Because, uh, you know, and, and I happen, I mean, talk to hospitals, talk to doctors, talk to healthcare. They realize that there are in, in, intense pressures in America to keep down the cost of healthcare. But all of them believe that getting people seen for problems <laughs> Um, before they become ill and not using the emergency room as a doctor's office is a good thing. Uh, and so whatever tweaks there'll be to the law, you know, health care reform is here to stay now. So, Yes, sir? Hey, I was just wondering, have you ever uh, written a speech for Obama and thought, how, uh, like, how am I able to defend this particular policy? Or does it require a total buy-in to the White House and its policies and all that sort of stuff? What's funny is, Every single event I've done since I left the White House, I get that question. <laughs> um, 
and it's interesting to me because I just never thought of it while I was there. And there are times when I may have disagreed with our tactics or our strategy on something, but I, there's not one issue that the president, um, you know, I, maybe I'm just a Kool-Aid drinker, but, or maybe <laughs> we just think alike, but there's just not one issue that he's been for or that he's talked about that I felt weird defending. I, I've just been, you know, I've been very, very proud to work for him and I'm very lucky um, because I don't think, you know, you don't always get that, that chance, but, you know, the president and I got to know each other while he was in the Senate and talked a lot about politics and, and, and our views on issues during those two years when he wasn't quite as busy. And, you know, we just connected. So maybe perhaps we sort of formed the same views at the same time together. <laughs> but, um, but the same is true for most of the people I work with as well. Um, at least in the communications kind of senior advisory roles, I think everyone kind of has similar views. I think when you get out to, you know, when you bring in a ton of different economists and a ton of different folks on national security, those people are gonna more likely to have different kind of views uh, and opposing views of each other, right? That's a good thing. But um, the people that are close to the president, I think, uh, are there because they really, they believe in what he's doing. Uh, I've just started reading again. <laughs> For a long time, people asked me that question, and I was like, I don't read any books because all I do is write. <laughs> um, I just read a, um, a wonderful book called News, a User's Manual by Alain du Baton. I can't remember, I can't say his last name right. <laughs> um, and he's, um, and it's all about, it's kind of about some of what I was talking about today, which is the sociology and philosophy of the news and how it's come to define our society and, um, and how it has a lot more impact on how we think about politics, how we think about our own lives, how we think about the world around us. Um, so I would encourage everyone to read it. It's a very, very good book. News, a user's manual. manual. It just, just came out a couple months ago. Um, and then just for so long, as a speechwriter where I drew my inspiration from, mostly, were past speeches from uh, a lot of American politicians. And so, the writings and works of Robert F. Kennedy, John F. Kennedy, and Martin Luther King, uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, particularly because he was president in a depression and you know, a major war, and so there were certain parallels there. Um, so uh, as speechwriters, we look back to, the, to all those, uh, those past greats for, for inspiration. Uh, yes. Hey, you told me? Yes, sure. <laughs> Get around to everyone. Speaking <laughs> of the major speeches he did over the years, Barack Obama, and some, what some of the ones that a lot of us have seen most of are the funny ones that he did, to yeah. like the White House Correspondence Dinner. Yeah. I was wondering if the, for the funny stuff, is it you that writes a lot of it? Do you find it any tougher than the serious stuff? Uh, it's much tougher than the serious stuff. And fortunately, it's me and a great team of. Um, of comedians. <laughs> um, so one of the speechwriters that worked for me, John Lovett, who since went out to Hollywood and wrote a television show as well. Um, he's very funny, so he took the lead in a lot of the writing of the jokes. David Axrod, who's one of the president's top advisors, uh, he's very funny. So Ax, Lovett, and I would kind of work on jokes together, but then we'd reach out and we had writers from The Daily Show, writers from Saturday Night Live, just people from Hollywood um, contribute jokes here and there, and some we'd use and some we wouldn't. And it was the most fun speech we'd work on every year, and it was also one of the more difficult ones. Because humor, well, I believe humor is, you know, one of the most important tools you can use to persuade, to communicate if you're in public office. It's also very difficult because you have to balance, you know, this joke is so funny, but the president would get in trouble if he used it, <laughs> versus uh, this joke is totally fine, but it sounds like it's coming from a cheesy politician, right? So we constantly had to balance those two things. But um, no, my, my favorite correspondence center, of course, was um, the night where he just assaulted Donald Trump. <laughs> yeah, I just tell people, we, yeah, we, we defeated uh, Osama bin Laden and Donald Trump in the same weekend, so it was pretty, it was pretty useful. Um, but those were fun. The president, he's, he's very big on humor, and his, he'll, he'll edit the jokes himself right up until the end. Like, he's got a good ear for these things, and then he practices the delivery. Um, and he's got a good ear for comedy, and he, he kind of, he knows how to tell a joke pretty well. Yes? Uh, you pointed out that he had a very specific experience by being very young, mm -hmm. very early on in his career. 
Um, obviously, there's always criticism of young people in that sense that you know people say, "Oh, you're inexperienced." Mm -hmm. that. How did you deal with that criticism? And do you have any tips for young people like us trying to succeed? Yes, <laughs> um, I did. I mean, look, when I, by the time that you had this entire campaign apparatus, and then by the time you had this White House apparatus, you know, people knew that I had a close relationship with the president, so that helped me. Um, but there were still a lot of meetings that I would think to myself, you know, if the speechwriter was 35, 40 years old, would he be included in this meeting, you know? Um, the one thing you have to realize is if someone, if someone has hired you or someone has included you in, a, in an organization or a campaign or whatever, and you're young, you're there because someone believes in you and someone believes in your ideas, and so you should speak up. And you should not be afraid to speak up because you're there for a reason. And I think sometimes, you know, if you're, and I, I used to do this too, I think to myself in a big meeting, oh, I should not say anything, I'm the 24 year old here, you know, and I'll just be quiet in the back. And then, you know, the, the president was good because what he'll do in meetings is he'll call in every single person in the meeting, um, even if it's not a topic that you're an expert on, because he just wants to hear from everyone. So he'd force everyone to talk, and that kind of helped me too. But I think, you know, you don't, you know, you don't want to be like, oh, I'm the smartest person ever, and I'm great, and you know, screw all you old people. Um, <laughs> you don't have that kind of attitude. But at the same time, I, I really think you've got to, it, it, it takes a certain confidence and, uh, and some risk taking too, into thinking that your ideas and your opinions are just as valuable as anyone else's. Um, and being young is, you know, it shouldn't be a barrier to that. Yes? I love that, Jeff. What's your view on this? Do you believe there's things people can do or are doing to sort of unify America with the news? Or is that a better discussion? What you think? So, Obama's line was always, you know, I believe, um, I believe the country is not as divided as our politics suggests, which I still believe to be true today. I think that when you look at American politics, it, it does seem hopelessly divided. I think when you go out into the country and you talk to people, you don't find that. Um, I traveled with him the entire 2012 free elect campaign, and after four years of Obama, the Muslim socialist, is running our country, um, you just met a lot of people who either liked him and supported what he was doing, or when they didn't support what he was doing, did so in a very reasonable way and said, you know, I, I like what you're trying to do, but my small business is hurting, or I'm not making enough money. You know, they, the people who would talk to him in town halls, the people we'd see in focus groups, the people he'd meet, they just, they didn't reflect the venom that you see on, you know, Fox News or Twitter or some of these right-wing websites. That, that, I think those people, and you know, the same is true on the left wing too, but those people represent a very small proportion of our population who have a disproportionate voice because they're very loud. <laughs> um, and I think that, and you know, this goes back to, they, they, they get heard. They, the, it's a more interesting interview to come on, and, and I, I've learned this now too because I've been asked to like come on cable and you know, like, I'm like a part-time cable pundit once in a while and it's horrible. <laughs> but like, you know, if you, if you go on cable and you're just like completely reasonable and you're not like attacking someone or makes it, you're not as interesting. <laughs> um, and what they want is people who are gonna be bomb throwers, right? And so, and as a result, people who are watching think, oh God, everyone's just at each other's throats all the time. But that's, that's not what the country's like, you know? Um, now what to do about that? That's a different question. Um, you know, this, this, to me, this gets back to the more people, the more ordinary citizens are involved and speak out and make your voices heard. This kind of like silent majority of people who are reasonable, whether you're on the right or the left, the more they participate, the more you'll drown out those other people. So, uh, yes. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I wonder if George Bush's aides uh, once said that working in the White House is more like the office than the West Wing. Would you agree with that? <laughs> That's really funny. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's definitely not like, the only similarities to the West Wing are like the hours and everyone like, you know, running around a lot. No one speaks in sentences that snappy. <laughs> um, so, you know, I mean, like, 
at some point we got like contacted by some documentary and they're like, oh, we'd love to do like a day in the life of, of John Favreau. And I'm like, really? Because the day in the life of me would be like, here's me at my computer at 7 a.m. and I'm still there at 10 p.m. <laughs> and like I went to get lunch and then like 20 handfuls of M&Ms in the meantime and that's about it. <laughs> so welcome to my day in the life of the White House. Um, so yeah, I don't think, yeah, there is a little bit of an office to it. I mean, I think I was talking about Veep. I think that captures, you know, a, some element of what happens in the White House. But I, I think the weird thing about the White House versus the campaign for me was um, campaign is in this big open office in Chicago. Everyone's talking to each other the whole time. People are yelling. Think it's, it's fast paced environment. That's more like the West Wing almost. Um, the White House itself, the West Wing is very small. All the offices are very tiny. They're all closed off. And then you have the old executive office building where most of the other rest of the staff is. And they're all kind of closed off from each other. So this, the actual architecture and physical structure of the White House space doesn't lend itself to a lot of good teamwork communications. I mean, it's kind of like a relic of the past. You know, like if I was to, if anyone was to design a White House of, of today, you'd probably design it a lot differently than they did way back when. Um, so I think part of what we all had to wrestle with is we were a very cooperative team in 2008 and we worked with each other and you could yell across the hall to someone and in the White House you didn't always have that because everyone was kind of enclosed in their own offices so it became a lot harder. So a lot of times the White House can be pretty, it can be quiet on a daily basis um, unless you're, you know, dealing with the crisis in the situation room or anything that was happening in the Oval Office was always pretty crazy too. But yeah, so I'd say a little bit of neither. <laughs> yes, sir. Do you think that politicians are more tempted to campaign at the expense of governing? And also, because you're different political groups presenting different facts, do you not find it's very hard to know what is true? Mm. Um, it's very, it's very hard. I mean, the fact checkers now get attacked regularly, right, by both sides. And so when each side is kind of arguing with their own set of facts, and, I mean, I, you know, I watch, sometimes I watch Fox News, and it's like, this is like a complete alternative reality that people have <laughs> built up. You know, like, I, I don't usually watch Fox, um, but I watched Bill O'Reilly interview the president right there in the Super Bowl. And it's like Benghazi, IRS, like all these issues that had been settled like months and months ago, <laughs> right? When you have a country where like people are looking for jobs, there are wages, I mean, there's plenty of problems. There's plenty of ways to be tough on the president, right? I'm not saying you should, plenty of ways to hold them accountable, plenty of ways, what's going on with the health care law, how do we fix it, you can do all that. But there's these, like, these issues that people get, right, you know, and they get on and they just keep going and going and going and no fact, no argument can persuade them otherwise, right? And so that becomes very difficult. Um, I think as far as sacrificing governing for campaigning, some, some do, um, for Obama, I think that what he always said in 2008 was, uh, you can have the best plans and policies in the world, but unless you can inspire a country to action, unless you can inspire a movement and you can get people involved again, those plans and policies aren't going to matter. And so for him, campaigning is the tool through which you get people interested in politics and governing again. That's, that's kind of how he viewed campaigning. Other people, you know, other politicians, especially at the end of a long campaign, it becomes like the least common denominator and how much you can attack each other and like you have no idea what you're arguing over because it's like some gaffe that happened a couple of weeks. I mean, it just, the silly, it, it gets really, really silly campaigning sometimes. But I think at its best, campaigning is a tool to inspire. And I think that's, that's critical um, because you don't always get to do that on the day-to-day -day process of governing because you are responding to every single issue that happens all the time. And there's not enough room for that poetry all the time. But how can you inspire people if one person <coughs> says A is true, and mm -hmm. the other person says, well, I'll tell you one thing, A is definitely not true. <laughs> right. The one thing it's not is true. <laughs> yeah. How can you inspire people if what you say is inspiration, the other side it says is, you know, fear. Yeah. But this goes back to what I was saying um, earlier, which is, yeah, there's going to be a percentage of people who you just can't persuade, they are the small percentage of people. Um, and there, are, there is a very large, large majority, vast majority of people in the middle, not middle because, the, you know, Republicans, Democrats, and independents in our country, who, um, you know, will look for the facts in places like <laughs> reputable news organizations, and they'll try to find them out on their own, and, you know. So I don't think that um, it's not quite as, it's not quite a, as big of a crisis 
on a on a widespread scale as as we might think. Um, but there are you know there are segments that are just going to believe their own stuff. <laughs> yes, sir. So the president of the public image of being really cool and measured and controlled. But mm -hmm. in private, did he ever just kind of snap and drop? <laughs> 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 and and sir, and sir. Uh, he never did. <laughs> it's so weird. <laughs> it's so weird. I, I heard I wasn't there. I heard when um, the closest he came was when when healthcare.gov got screwed up pretty badly. Um, you know, because his view was, look, uh, if you come to me and say, this is not going to be ready in time, and there's all these problems, and we're going to have to push the deadline, I'm going to be disappointed, but I'm going to understand. If you don't tell me this, and we just go live, and, and you didn't let me know, then, you know, that's, that's horrible. <laughs> so I think that first, and especially because the president's fundamental belief is um, government can be a force for good. And he also thinks that those of us who believe that government can be a force for good have an obligation to prove that. And because healthcare.gov and, and, the, and the kind of rollout errors with that threatened to, um, threatened to disprove that, you know, he was very, very upset by it. Um, but on, he just, he, on a daily basis, he just doesn't fly off the handle. He just doesn't get himself, you know, and, and, and we all do. During the campaign, we would be like, What's with this poll, that poll, this gaffe, this is the end of the world, you know? And the president, he always takes the long view. He always says, you know, we're in this for the long haul and all we can do is make the best decisions that we can make. Um, and usually we're faced with a lot of bad choices and we just have to make the better of the bad choices. <laughs> he, always, he, he usually says, look, if, if a choice, if a decision was uh, easy, I wouldn't be the one making it. It would be made somewhere else in the United States government or in the private sector or somewhere else. He goes, the decisions that get all the way to my desk are decisions where both choices are pretty bad. <laughs> <laughs> and I just have to figure out how to make the better one. And he, he's just very realistic about that. And he doesn't let it get him down. And so when you have that kind of temperament, um, it's, you know, it's, it's a good temperament to have in a president and a leader. But uh, I also think it's why he doesn't you know, fly off the handle. So. Yes? Oh, yes. Um, and it's a, it's a hell of a speech, no, no offense to the other speeches, but uh, no, yeah. it's an incredible one. Um, it's also a very edgy one. It was uh, something that could have been found very badly. Could you give us just a little bit of insight as yeah. to what happened? Because that was on the campaign trail as, as well. Yeah, I was, um, I, David Axelrod is in the middle of writing his book about his, his time at the White House, and he just called me last week about this to go through the race speech because he's on that I section. On that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so I, I relived the race speech thing earlier. Um, so what happened was the Friday, uh, the Friday when the Reverend Wright tapes came out, um, the campaign thought, all right, let's put him on a bunch of cable shows, and uh, and that'll make it go away. And he was awful on those cable shows because you know, you get like 30 seconds to explain something that's very complicated. Um, so he, that, that night, he called Axelrod and said, I, I want to deliver a speech on race. I don't want any debate about it. I'm doing it. I need to do it. It's happening. And I'm going to do it Tuesday. This is like Friday night. Um, and then they tell me Saturday morning, and I flip out, because that's what writers do. Um, and... The president was campaigning all day on Saturday, so he didn't have time to work on it until, he didn't have time to call me about it until Saturday night. So he calls me Saturday night at like 10 p.m. after a long day of campaigning. And I was like, how are you? <laughs> and uh, he said, you know, this is, this is what running for president is. I have to deal with this if I want to be commander in chief, and I realize that. Um, so he's like, here's what we're gonna do. I will give you stream of consciousness thoughts off the top of my head on this speech. And, and then you can do a draft tomorrow and then we'll, we'll, we'll keep working on it. His stream of consciousness thoughts were the most like logical, structured argument <laughs> I'd ever heard. It was like one, one A, two, two. <laughs> People always like, you know, the president's known for his like inspiring rhetoric, but his lawyerly mind is, is quite impressive. And, and, the, and the professor in him too. I mean, he, he had this speech, he had the whole structure laid out. So he talked to me for about an hour and um, and then it was St. Patrick's Day, so I was freaked out enough that I went and had a drink. And then I went to bed, and then Sunday morning I woke up, and uh, I started writing. And gave him a draft at about 6, 7 p.m., and he stayed up till 3 in the morning that night. 
writing, he sent me back a track changes version of the speech, <laughs> uh, which was pretty much mostly track changes. <laughs> um, and then Monday I worked on it some more, and then I sent it to him again Monday night, and Monday night he stayed up till three again, three in the morning, and worked on that speech and sent more track changes. And then he sent it to me and to Axrod and to Valerie Jarrett and said, this is the speech, Fabs, you're welcome to fool with the rhetoric and grammar and flow and rhythm, but other than that, no one touches any of the substantive points. This is what I'm going to say. So if you look back at that speech today, you know, the lines that I wrote were the lines that you could write for any politician. The opening, the history, Philadelphia, all that kind of stuff. The lines that he wrote were lines like, you know, I can no more disown Reverend Wright than I can my white grandmother. You know, I was not going to give him that line. <laughs> I was not going to tell my boss to do that, right? Um, but he, and, and he just, he said, this is what I have to do. And, and he ran that whole campaign thinking to himself, look, if I lose this race, Hillary Clinton's the nominee, we have a good strong nominee, she'll go on, she can, you know, and I will go home to my family in Chicago and raise them and have a happy life. I don't need this because it's a job. I want this because I think I can make a difference. And because that's the reason I want this job, I'm gonna say what's on my mind and I'm gonna say what I believe. That, and nowhere did that come through more than the race speech, you know? But it was, it was, I was pretty proud to work for him that day. So. Yes. Um, you know, when I when I was an intern in John Kerry's office, uh, I was a press intern, and so I did a lot of press clips, and you know, got lunches and all those kind of things. But but one night, um, Kerry's communications director said, "Oh, we want to place an op-ed from John Kerry in the Boston Herald." Um, for Martin Luther King Day. It's just a normal thing we're doing. I don't have time to do it. Would you mind going home tonight and taking a cut? And I was in college. And I went home and stayed up till like two or three in the morning thinking, this is one of the coolest things I've ever done. That, that I get to craft this story about, you know, John Kerry's beliefs in Martin Luther King Day and what the holiday represents and, and what the history means. And, and then, you know, I sent it in. And uh, a few days later, I, I didn't hear anything. So I was like, oh, they must have just like thrown it away. And then I opened up the Boston Herald and I could see like a couple words from my original op-ed in there. And um, I think when I, when I saw that, I started thinking speech writing, speech writing could be cool. Uh, and so then when I sat next to the Kerry speech writer right after college in that job, I just, I, I wanted to learn everything I could from him. And because I think that, like I was saying, I think that stories can make a difference. I think that inspiration can make a difference. And I think that we need to be inspired um, if, if we hope to change things. I think that's like the, the first ingredient to change. Um, so that's, that's what drew me to it. Yes, sir? Uh, reform of American politics. If you had a free hand, what would you do? Reform of American <laughs> politics. This will be super dorky and in the weeds. But um, we have congressional districts that are so gerrymandered, meaning that, uh, I mean, I've seen these maps, like, so I'll give you an example. Austin, Texas, right? Texas, everyone thinks pretty Republican, you know about United States, right? Austin is like this liberal bastion in Texas, very, very liberal, right? They have, the Republicans control the state legislature in Texas, so they draw the maps of which districts or which congressional districts go to Congress. Austin is split eight ways in the center of the city out <laughs> so that you can ensure that there is no Democratic representative in the United States Congress from Austin. Uh, and that's true in districts all across the country. And it's true in some Democratic districts too. And um, as a result, there are less competitive house races. And um, then you have a House of Representatives who, for us, have caused most of the gridlock over the last couple of years. We've gotten stuff done with the Senate. I mean, it wasn't for the House. Immigration reform, which is a pretty big piece of business, passed the Senate with Republicans and Democrats, even in this environment. Barack Obama would have signed it into law. But you have a House of a House representatives controlled by the Tea Party Republicans who can block everything. And people, it's hard because people are like, well, he's Obama. He's the President of the United States. How can he not? You know, well, that's our Constitution. Constitution gives the House that much power. And if we're making these districts that uncompetitive, then I mean, the problem is you can see in America, down the road, the Republicans, it will almost be impossible for the Republicans to win the presidency because of how many different constituency they've, constituencies they've alienated, but they could keep a hold on Congress 
for a very, very long time. So you could have Democratic presidents and Republican Congresses for a very long time in the United States. And that's, that's a big problem. Yes. Hi, sorry. I want to thank you again for coming to but um, you were talking earlier about how you read a lot of old speeches and stuff like that. Do you have like a favorite speech, or one that you're kind of like, you think that's the best speech that you need to do? I do. Um, <clears throat> the night that Martin Luther King was shot. Um, yeah, Bobby Kennedy's speech. And he, he was in Indiana, and um, I remember reading about this and talking with older now, but reporters who had been there, actually. My friend's uncle was there. And the, his speechwriters gave him a piece of paper with some, I almost some thoughts because he had to address it to the crowd. And Bobby said, no, I'm, I'm okay, I'm good. And he got up on the back of a truck and in a crowd, a mixed race crowd, when the whole nation was thinking, we're about to face riots and uprisings and everything like that, he gave this speech where he not only memorialized King in his life, but used it to inspire people about what America could be. And he has this line at the end of the speech, um, which is so simple and doesn't have a lot of rhetoric around it, but he just says, we can do well in this country. We can. And uh, in you know, 1968, in, in the United States and around the world, that was a pretty, that was a pretty uh, optimistic and hopeful thing to say at a night like that. Um, and so I just, I, I always look at that speech because I think sometimes the most inspirational, memorable speeches are not you know, soaring rhetoric and you're just using the, you're building all kinds of metaphors, you know, that's what writers do, but it's just like simple, simple language um, and, and that, that's really, really heartfelt, uh, that really kind of inspires. So that's, that's my favorite. Yes? Hi, um, just like to get from them, um, I found it very funny that your story seems so similar to Ted Sorensen's. Oh. Like, sorry, so, yeah, so I am actually, I'm going to be sorry now, but I'm going to ask something that you're not going to like about cynicism. <laughs> Basically, I had a lot of uh, hope for Obama. I was really pro Obama for quite a while. And for me, kind of the nail in the coffin came when it came down to the NSA. Mm -hmm. The way he responded to what I think is one of the greatest breaches of individual rights, which is the bastion of America, it's individual rights. I thought that was massive, and I thought that he didn't come down. Obviously, he can't come down, but he didn't come down on the side of Snowden. He came down the other way. And I really, that kind of broke my love for Obama. Which won't be here the no, this, look, this is a very, very tough issue. And um, here's what I know. Uh, I don't, this is one where like, you know what you don't know, right? And I am not read into all the NSA programs. I wasn't read into all the NSA programs. So I don't know everything that went on or why. But um, I know a lot of the people who worked there, uh, not at the NSA, but a lot of people who were, worked in the White House that oversaw those programs. And I know Barack Obama very well. And this is a man who, um, was a constitutional law professor and believes in the right to privacy and individual freedom very, very strongly. Uh, and so what I believe is that I know that when you get into the White House and you look around the world uh, and, and you see every day and, and you get your presidential daily briefing every day from the CIA and they tell you the, th the threats that are out there around the world and the plots that were this close to not being disrupted, um, I mean, it's, for me, it's, a, it's, it's something that changed while I was in the White House because, you know, I was no fan of George Bush. And when George Bush would go out and be like, well, no, it's fine because we stopped terrorist plots, you know, and so I can do whatever I want, I'd be like, oh, that's crazy, you know. But the fact is, I mean, the, the people I have the most respect for in some ways, are these guys in the FBI and in some ways, you know, a lot of people in the CIA, they, you know, every time something goes wrong, every time there's a breach, every time there's an overreach, right? We know about it and they get in trouble for it, right? We will never know all of the plots that they have stopped or all of the lives that they have saved um, because they had to do some very difficult things. I, I do not think that Obama would have a program that was just, you know, where he knows for sure that anyone was spying on anyone all the time. He, doesn't, he just doesn't like that. But I'd also think that he needs the capabilities and he would keep the capabilities to make sure that if anyone is talking on email somewhere around the world who wants to harm the United States or wants to harm our allies or anyone around the world, that he needs to have that capability. Because it's a different world and because you know, the next plot is developed on, you know, on Gmail or something like that. Um, and so I think that, I mean, Ed, the, thing with it, the thing with Edward Snowden that kind of bothers me is, you know, he, 
it's one thing to feel so strongly that you have to, um, you know, you have to speak out about these things. But to talk to, to go to China, to go to Russia, to go to people and, and to like talk about our capabilities to them, that what, what's the purpose of that? Those are, we, we know those, those guys are, we know those guys are spying on all of us in really big ways. Um, and so, you know, these things are not, it, it, it's tough because it's not pleasant, right? But I think that what Obama, I know what Obama does every day is, is try very hard to strike a very difficult balance between protecting the privacy of the people that he governs and people around the world and keeping everyone safe. Um, and that's, you know, we can, we can say that that's just a cliche, but it's a, it's, a, it's a real issue and it's a real debate and it's very, very difficult. And there's just, there's daily tough calls and some you get right and some you don't. But the point where you have to go so far that you're directly infringing of like you know, citizens' rights privacy and international citizens' rights privacy because you're afraid of a terrorist attack, is that not straight away letting the terrorists win? Because you've been so terrified that you yourself, rather than them, have been the one taking away people's human rights, basically. I mean, you're only terrified of you're only terrified of a terrorist if you've just learned that they're about to plot something. <laughs> then you have reason to be terrified. They don't act. You know, it's not just like, hey, let's go listen in and see what happens. Um, and you know, if we get something great, if not, whatever. No, it's we know this name. We have a lead. We have some intelligence from here. Let's start piecing it together. And if we can piece it together, then per then perhaps we can stop this plot. And we know we've stopped a ton in the United States. Now, this does not mean that there, are, that there have been you know, times when people have gone overboard or in an organization as large as the CIA or the NSA, there aren't people who you know, did what they shouldn't be doing. Of course, there's big organizations, right? Um, but as we correct those things and as we strengthen the rights to privacy and strengthen all that kind of, I think we just have to make sure that we don't go too far in either direction, right? You just, it's a balance and you just, I think you need to have the capabilities to keep people safe and you also need to work really, really hard to make sure you're protecting people's privacy. That's my view. Yes? Um, yeah. <laughs> well, Grant, I mean, I told you the story, of course, you know, with Ann Nixon Cooper, and um, I, I mean, I can remember, like, every minute after that, right, which is, they took us all on a trolley and uh, all the staffers from the campaign headquarters, and went, we went down Lakeshore Drive in Chicago, right to the Grant Park, where he gave the speech, and my family was there, and some of my closest friends, and, um, and then it was like a whirlwind the next couple it was just so weird to see. For so long, we didn't believe that it, I mean, we believed it, but like, we always thought like, oh my God, he's gonna, we've worked on this for like a year and a half, we haven't slept. <laughs> and we've endured all of these attacks and this campaign and stuff like that. And so you have to pinch yourself for a couple of weeks uh, to, to realize that it actually had happened. Um, and then I remember the first day in the White House, you know, it was the inauguration day. He gets inaugurated and then the senior staff has to like walk into the White House and start working. And immediately, of course, like our computers and emails didn't work. <laughs> and so there's like six of us sitting around the White House just like, what are we doing here? We're supposed to like be like running the country? <laughs> What's uh, the technology in the White House has been upgraded since, since we got there. It was not so great when we first arrived. Um, but yeah, those, those first couple weeks were, they were, there were tons of pinch yourself moments that, that whole time. Yes? Oh, just nice. Oh. Would you ever consider going into politics yourself? And why or why not? Yeah. You know, <laughs> it's funny you mentioned my commencement speech. I, I, mm. I had read that. I hadn't read it in a while. And I guess I talked about maybe running for office You there. did, yeah. <laughs> and I had put that so far out of my mind uh, since then just because I want to make a difference. I want to keep making a difference in whatever way I can. Um, I so admire people who run for office. It is such a difficult thing on your family and on your life because you know we we expect so much of our politicians today. We put them on a pedestal and then you know we like to knock them down, and it's really it's hard to do. Um, and so you know, at some point you have to think long and hard in your life about whether you want to put yourself out there and do that and do that to your family and suddenly make sure that you're you know 
decide that your life is not your own anymore. Um, and you know, I don't know if I don't know if I can do that. Um, but I do know that I, I, I want to make a difference, and I want to keep talking about these issues. And there's a million different ways to serve and to help. Um, like I was saying, so you know, we'll we'll see. But it doesn't running for office after after watching <laughs> a good friend of mine run for office for a long time seems uh, seems difficult. Yes. Um, the Anne Nixon Cooper story is obviously very dramatic. What would you like to be voting for when you're 106? What would I like to be voting for? Oh boy. You know, I would like to be voting for. I mean. My big, I, the, the, the one project that I think will be unfinished when Obama leaves office that, that he really cares about is how in a globalized world can we still make sure that we have emerging strong middle classes in, in countries, right? And it sounds so simple and like simple economics, but there's you know, unimaginable wealth and unimaginable potential for innovation that creates wealth. And we have to decide um, in a world now where it's, you know, there is, you know, trade barriers fall and we're all kind of trading with each other in all different countries, how to set up institutions and set up rules that make sure that workers get a fair shot and that if you're working hard and, and that you can raise a family and you can send people to college and just these basic economic issues um, and, and, and the president's been talking about <coughs> inequality, right? And I think that um, as, as we go forward as a society, not just in the United States, but elsewhere, as, as, as the gap between rich and poor grows, I think, you know, that is not just dangerous for democracy, it's, um, you know, it's, it's dangerous for society, uh, many different societies. And so I, I'd be like, I'd like to vote for, uh, you know, more sensible policies on, on economics and middle class issues. And yeah. Um, Go for um, it. One, 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 one. <laughs> so you just talked about the more perfect union uh, speech, mm -hmm. uh, which I just wrote an essay last night. Oh, cool. <laughs> um, so the speech was basically reproduced after the ruling of the trade war marketplace as well. And every single time the president kind of addresses the issue of race, there's always a national debate about it, whether it was appropriate for him to do that or not. Yeah. So I wanted to know, um, how do you kind of judge the racial climate in the United States today, and how much did you always have to take that into consideration when writing for biracial climate? Yeah, I mean, you always have to take it. it, it it's one of those topics in the United States that, it, again, it attracts a lot of attention in, in the news, sometimes warranted, sometimes not. Um, but I know that it's, it's, it's easy with Obama because like on Trayvon, he was like, I'm gonna go say this and that's it. We're not gonna have a big debate about it. This is what, you know, when he said, if I had a son, he would look like Trayvon. He had said that in a meeting before and you know, there was no one in that room who was gonna tell him, oh, maybe you shouldn't, you have to think about this, calculate it out. This is what I believe, I'm gonna say it. Um, so for him, there's not a lot of consider, I mean, there's consideration, right? Because I think he speaks very eloquently about race and also very in a balanced way. But um, yeah, as a speechwriter, you're always kind of dancing around. But you know, we have a boss who knows what he's going to say on that. So we're kind of lucky. Other people <laughs> who write for politicians talking about race, you know, it's, it's tread lightly. Um, but look, I think I once, I once was asked by a reporter, how can a uh, young white kid from suburban Boston write for the first black president who has roots in you know, Hawaii and father from Kenya and all this kind of stuff. And I was like, you know why? Because Martin Luther King inspired a nation not because he spoke to African Americans, it's because he spoke to the values that all Americans and people all over the world embrace. Peace, justice, and dignity, and equality, and opportunity, these are things that connect all people. Um, and I think that when you focus on those values and that language and that rhetoric that unites us, um, then you know you, you really can't go wrong. And I and I, I really believe that about race as well. And on that note, I'd really like to thank you, John. Thank for, you for guys. Coming today. A really um, great conversation. I've been inspired, as I'm sure you all have, and I'm sure you'll join me in thanking John again for for coming. Yes. Yeah. The, uh, the, oh, <laughs> the, the award itself. Thank you so much. So, great. Uh, so really excited. Thank you. Uh, Thank you.
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank